Welcome back to part three of our delicious conversation with Perry Marshall. We've been talking about cognitive-based evolution. We've been talking about viruses. We've been talking about what viruses really are. We've been talking about the intelligence inside of the system that is called you that has got nothing to do with you cognitively thinking about it. It's about an intelligence that is within you that sorts things out and the, the primacy of DNA, that how much that was put forward. It couldn't wait to unspiral the DNA. And we thought that when we get to the human genome, we're going to really understand human beings. What we discovered is we didn't understand very much at all through that. And the work of epigenetics and brilliant epigeneticists over time, actually since the late 60s, with people like Bruce Lipton, have showed that it's actually not the DNA, but rather the epigenetics, meaning what the DNA is sitting in or what it's uh, surrounded by that turns it on or turns it off. And so, as example, uh, I believe it was L-lysine, which is an amino acid in the body. Uh, there are 17 receptors in every human body for L-lysine, but only three are turned on in any body in any kinds of sequence. And it's incredibly subjective. But why is it turned on and why is it not turned on? Depends on the epigenetics, depends on the environment. It's a fascinating subject. And we were talking about how this consciousness is there within us, but it is also without us. And so there's this idea that, and again, it's through reductionistic science, that we are separate from. Therefore, everything is broken down into separate pieces, and each piece is separate from, as opposed to all existing within rather than reducing it down, that is all connected together. So when we get into that way of thinking, we start to become a little bit more willing to expand beyond the almost narcissistic idea we have of the world, which is, it's my world. It's, you know, am I having an impact? I hope I'm having a positive impact. But the truth of the matter is, I don't exist without the existence of everything else, including you, listening to this podcast. We want to dive in a little bit deeper into this conversation in the context of this cognition and it being more than that. So I mentioned in the last part the, the quantum field. Uh, and so I just want to talk about something here and then get you to jump in on it, Perry, which is, I'm trying to remember what it was. I've forgotten the year, I apologize. But there's a very well-known Russian scientist. His name was Vladimir Poponin. Vladimir Popunin. So Vladimir Popunin was, like I said, a very well-known Russian scientist who makes significant uh, contributions to various fields, particularly in biophysics and molecular quantum biology. And he talked about it was known as the phantom effect of DNA. And what that was was they put DNA uh, into a container and, and watched how the photons, the, the light particles, would surround it. But what was interesting is when they removed the DNA, the photons remained in the shape of the DNA. So the DNA had changed the field, and the field was interacting with the DNA. There was no actual separation. It was as if the DNA was still there when it was already gone. So the DNA was having impact on the field, and the field was having an impact on the DNA. And that it's a holographic information. Now, when you think about that, you might go, okay, I don't get that. Well, you've seen Star Trek and you've got these holographic lounges where things seem very real, but you kind of know they're not. Well, it's not that they're not real. It's that you have a perception of what real is. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. It's the perception or the, the definition of real. And so the analogy I've given before, and I know if you follow any of my work, you know this, is that if we look at what's real and the year is 1800, what's real is a very small circle. And if we say, well, what's everything outside of that real? Well, it's mystical, it's unreal, or it's non-scientific. And then I say, well, okay, it's 2020, just 2020. And then we say, okay, how big is that circle now? Well, it's a hell of a lot bigger. So what about all the stuff that suddenly got encompassed in there? How did it go from mystical? Well, we had somehow some kind of equipment or some kind of measuring device to say, oh, we can understand it now. A lot of the time, what we're calling not real or mystical is simply what we don't understand. And a lot of Perry's work into this understanding of evolution 2.0 
is this understanding that has broadened that circle for us to take things in that previously seemed mystical and are now not. And now we're taking this into the virology and that viruses are not suddenly what we thought they were in our perception of reality. So I don't want to give you a lot to chew on there, Perry. I apologize. Can you jump in on some of that? Yes. So there's a very, very, very famous thing called the double slit experiment. Yes. And it says that if I'm shining laser light at a screen, I, uh, through a slit, I get a wave. But if I point a particle detector at the slit, I get a particle instead of a wave, which seems to mean if I'm looking for a wave, I get a wave. And if I'm looking for a particle, I get a particle. Now, the thing that I think is really remarkable about this that doesn't get mentioned as often is that if you unplug the particle detector, it'll go back to being a wave. And what that means is not only does the system change based on your expectation of, of the observer, it even changes based on what is possible for the observer to observe. Now, if that is a strain, I don't know what is. Now, I believe that this is the foundation of choice. Exactly. And agency in the world. We have known for well over a hundred years that the double split experiment is true and it has been run countless, countless, countless times. And we know that the expectation of an observer changes an event. We know that even the possibility of whether an observer can know about the event or not changes the event. Eisenberg's uncertainty principle says both the observer and the observed are changed by the observation. Yes. Just think about that for a minute. If you want to understand why therapy is important, that's why therapy is important. I try to explain this to people all the time. That's why therapy is important, because when you observe it, you are changed by observing it, and it is changed by the observation. So this full stop means that the world is not just billiard balls banging around in the universe. The world is observational. Yeah. Matter and energy are observational. So that very fact alone wipes out the reductionist view of the world that says that if I understand, if I subdivide and subdivide and subdivide and I finally categorize every detail that I will finally understand everything. No, because subdividing separates the observer from the thing being observed. The thing being observed is affected by the observation. Even you subdividing is an act of observation. So you cannot get away from this. Now, I wrote a paper uh, published earlier this year called The Role of Quantum Mechanics in Cognition-Based Evolution. And what I say in that paper is whatever mechanism it is that makes observation possible, let's call it consciousness, is the thing that drives biology. It is the central mystery of biology, which is where does a choice come from? Where does information come from? Where does the genetic code come from? Where does evolution come from? Where does the ability of a cancer cell to morph and resist radiation and chemo, where does that come from? In that paper, I say all of these things are not six or seven questions. They are one question. And the question is, what is cognition and where does it come from? That is the central question in biology. Well, it's the central question of psychology. It's the central question of philosophy. Yeah, right? it's the central question of everything, which is the the hardest question is, what is consciousness? Yes. Right. Ken Wilder and every philosopher before has asked that question, what is consciousness? 
and is consciousness cognitive of its own consciousness? Right? Which is more in- this is exactly what every religion is concerned with. Every religion you've ever seen, no matter strawberry, vanilla, chocolate, wh- whatever version, all religions are concerned with what kind of human being should you be and how do we raise your self-awareness and your awareness of others so that you can be that kind of human. Yes. So consciousness is the fundamental religious question as well. Yeah, and it's interesting to me that we're always trying to understand our world, and that's, in my opinion, is a good thing. But rarely do we go to the root. If we go to the root, which is, how can we understand? Well, what about how do we understand ourselves? We write out these, these pathologies around it. But no, hold on a second. This question of consciousness puts us into the woo-woo as far as a lot of people are concerned. And to me, it's like, it's the least woo-woo, but it is the most frustrating, sure. But again, it's that circle analogy I gave. It's just like, it's getting bigger all the time. We're getting a deeper understanding of it. Mm -hmm. But it's almost like people want to shrink it down and say, well, this is this, this is that. Well, hold on. If you just grasp at a quantum field level, that you are living in consciousness. So, for instance, just for people to understand, this table in front of me, you can just hear me knock on it. Physicists don't know why it's solid. They can't tell you why. It doesn't make any sense that it's solid. It's a frequency modulation. It's a vibrating field that is held in place by what? Some form of consciousness that holds a tree together, that makes a tree form the way it forms. But we don't understand it, but we make these reductionistic ideas around it and say, well, the tree has cells and, you know, there are plant cells and the chloroform and blah, blah. Yeah, well, okay. But there's a resonance, a frequency vibrational field that's holding it together. And nobody wants to seem to grasp that, that this intelligence piece and then we want to go off onto some other argument about, well, my God's more important than your God. Well, my prophet is better than your prophet. And for me, where I've always gone to, as you know, very you and I have had many conversations about this, I think the fundamental central point of all religion and philosophy is how do we be better human beings? If Jesus was real, and I'm not saying he wasn't, he was trying to make us better human beings. If Buddha was real, I'm not saying he wasn't. He was trying to help understand ourselves better and be better human beings. And whoever you decide to choose, for, it was your prophet Muhammad or whoever it might be, weren't they all, before all the books got edited and people got in with their things, wouldn't that person, if you just went up to them, if you could go back in time and stand right in front of them, wouldn't they just say, could you be a bit better? Could you just like try a bit harder and be a bit better and not get so caught up in the shit that's going on. Instead of watching CNN or Fox, maybe you just treat somebody decently. It's that consciousness to evolve into a greater sense of yourself. But this is where I want to come to with you is the number one addiction of human beings is identity. And so if I'm addicted to my identity, how do I become better? Because my addiction says I have to be this. When this is not complete, but I make it complete by holding on to the identity. And I stop the evolution by holding on to the identity. And it's an interesting dichotomy in that I am pulled to keep it the same, particularly as somebody like me, I'm pulled to keep it the same, but I'm also pulled to constantly evolve it, which is the internal struggle, which I think, coming back to the DNA stuff, is the evolution of me. The evolution is between, the, is in the tension. You, we know this from storytelling. We know this in everything, in development. Everything is based in the tension. It's the tension between, this is who I am, and I don't know who I am, and I want it to become that. That tension is what's the most important thing in life. It's the tension between you and your lover. It's the tension between the moment your child's about to be born. It's the tension of the darkest of the dark night before the dawn comes. It's the tension where we find our soul, where we find this consciousness. Well, from what I understand, every cell and every 
molecule in your body gets replaced every seven years. Yes. So there is a very interesting, like, well, how did all the matter, I'm 54, how did all the matter in my body get switched out five, six, seven, eight times in my lifetime? I might not have any molecules that I had then as what I have now, yet there's a continuity that I am still the same person. And then you have really interesting things that happen, like Michael Levin, who we both interviewed. Michael scrapes a few a little clump of cells off of a tadpole and stimulates them and puts them in a Petri dish, and they become some other organism that's not the original tadpole. It has the same DNA, but it starts doing something nobody's ever seen before. It's not a tadpole, and it's not Charlie the tadpole either. So it, it has developed its own identity. So how does that work? How is it that you can take individual identities and merge them, which does happen in biology? And how is it that you can take one identity and split it? How does schizophrenia work? All of us are a little schizophrenic and we all know it. Part of us wants to be on a diet. Part of us wants the Oreo cookies. And there's a fight between the two parts of us. I'm schizophrenic about Oreos, okay. <laughs> but it's it's absolutely true. I mean, this is the thing. I wanted to write a book a long time ago, and it was called Tension. The The secret to life is tension. And we're all avoiding tension, yeah. but that's the secret to life. It's that tension, that, that sexual tension, that intellectual tension. But we want to win over rather than embrace the tension. Like you and I have had so many great conversations and we don't fully agree on everything. And it's the tension that makes me go, oh, I lean into that. That's cool. Well, let, let's circle back to the beginning of this conversation of tension and identity. Right. So I have my, this argument with my brother. And he says, I'm not a Christian anymore. I'm out. And I'm like, well, I have my wife. I have my kids. I read in Bible stories. I take them to church. What if Brian's right? And I remember there was a point in that conversation where I thought, well, you know, I kind of like the intelligent design version of the world. Isn't it good enough for me? If I just know that playbook really well, isn't that good enough? And I had this moment of truth where I was like, no, it's not good enough to just know your one position. You need to know the other position well enough to argue it persuasively. And you have to understand what would be appealing about that other position. Dove, I honestly can tell you, I was scared to death. Can I peel the onion on why I was scared to death? Please. There's a whole bunch of pieces to it. One of them is I'm part of this family. I'm part of the faith community. I got a church to go to. This all seems to work. It's not perfect, but it seems to work well enough. Well, what if this is not true? What if I come to the conclusion this isn't true? Are we going to go to Thanksgiving dinner and Brian and I are going to look at each other and roll our eyes while they pray to the invisible sky daddy? Is that what's going to happen? Am I going to have arguments with my wife about, well, dad's not going to church, but mom's taking the kids to church. Are we going to have arguments about what are we going to teach the kids? Okay, that's part of the problem. There's another problem too. I had studied this stuff already, and I knew history. And I knew that Friedrich Nietzsche, the German philosopher, he said, God is dead, and we don't need all that stuff anymore. In fact, he had this whole thing that he wrote about the death of God. We have killed God, and his blood is on our hands. And Nietzsche understood the consequences of that. And he said, well, this is really scary because when we kill God, we're going to have genocides and we're going to have mayhem because we have pulled the rug out from under Western civilization. And I already knew that. I had already learned that. I had already come to a conclusion. Nietzsche was wrong. God's not dead. God's there. The world is a purposeful place. We need to love each other. And I like this story. This makes sense. And now Brian is bailing and he's challenging. And I'm like, what if he's right? I have to take seriously that he could be right. Also, we'd had a bunch of theological conversations. My brother has a master's degree in theology. You have not had 
a religious argument until you had it with a guy who knows Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic, and he knows the Bible inside and out, and he knows where all the bones are buried, and he can tell you about all the scrolls and all the translations and all the church history. I was feeling very, very outmatched. And here, here's what really scared me. Oh, crap. What if Nietzsche is right? Mm. What if we do have to rebuild civilization from the ground up? What if Jesus loves me, this I know ain't true? Mm. That means giant reset button on your church, your life, your family, your philosophy, Western civilization, everything. He predicted what happened in Russia mm -hmm. at the Bolshevik Revolution. He predicted that, and it was awful. Mm -hmm. He predicted what the Germans did in World War II because that was a totally godless agenda that they had. It was wrapped in religious garb, but it was totally Nietzsche. Same Nietzsche. with Mao. Yes, and I knew this. That scared the crap out of me. But I said, as much as that scares me, I am going to follow the science wherever it leads. And I felt as though I w had leapt off of a cliff into pitch black, having no idea where I'm going to land. Am I going to hit a pole and slice myself in half? Am I going to go splat on the bottom? Am I going to have a nice soft landing on a big giant mattress? I have no idea. But I said, I have to make this leap. And it was a terrifying leap of identity. I do not know who I will be at the end of this search, but I have to be brave enough to make the search. And maybe I'll come to the same conclusion as Brian, or maybe I'll come to some other conclusion, but I can't not do it. It is the only honest thing I can do. I want to ask you, what was it like when you got to that place of this terrifying realism? What was it like going to church on Sunday? Oh, I had all kinds of questions. My radar, you know how like if you're buying a high the civic, you see high the civics all over the place. My reticular activating system was cranked up to 10. I was questioning everything. I was looking for evidence. My wife knew I was going through this. She knew there wasn't a damn thing she could do about it. She was kind of hanging on by friend, like, okay, I guess we're going to see where this goes. And I had a whole bunch of questions. I had questions about history. I had questions about miracles. I had questions about science had questions about engineering. I felt very tempted to buy into a nihilistic, meaningless interpretation of the world. One of the reasons is, is because there's a lot of disappointment in the world. Like a lot, a lot. Hello, look around. Yeah. There's a lot of- 2023, have a look around, folks. <laughs> there's a lot. If you believe- that God is good, if you believe in providence, if you believe in love, you have a lot of crap that you have to hold with an open hand and go, yeah, well, I don't think that stuff going on in Gaza looks very kind and loving, and I don't think that stuff in Ukraine looks very kind and loving, and when I go through a slum in El Salvador, I don't think that looks very kind and loving. If you go, oh, well, billiard balls banging around the universe and shit happens, then you don't have to explain anything. Well, actually, it only looks like you don't have to explain anything. But there's another problem. Now you have to explain why is there beauty and why is there love and why is it everything cancer? In fact, that's a great question that Michael Levin asks. He goes, the question isn't why we have cancer. The question is, why is it everything cancer? What is the organizational principle that Dove, you're over 60 years old and like you're a good looking guy and your hair looks nice and your forehead looks nice and your eyebrows look nice and your lips are working and we've been having a conversation. What holds all that stuff together? That's what you have to explain if you live in a nihilistic universe. And that was what the atheist could never explain. As I went deeper and deeper, the atheist explanations got shallower and shallower. I have been to the mat every possible way on these questions that you can imagine. I have had thousands of conversations about these things. I have arm wrestled. I have had the late night conversations. I've done the emails, the blog posts, the discussion forums. I think the atheist philosophy is vacuous and shallow. Mm. It punts on the painful questions 
but then it has no answer for the meaningful ones. Yeah, I mean, the, the atheist answer is, well, if if God is good, why do kids have cancer or why are kids born you? Right. I think it's a fair question, but it's a, it's not sure. enough of a question. Yes. That's yes. The there are more questions than just that. Right. And so for me, and this is me, and you know I've studied all the, those religions, I have abandoned the idea of a religion in any structural form. But I will tell you, like you, I have tried to abandon God. And I can't abandon God, only the form of it. And so I'm very much of the, the belief that man creates God in his own image. You know, that we've created this long-haired guy in the sky with a long beard, and I just, nothing about that that makes any sense to me. I don't see God as Father Christmas or Santa Claus or as an accountant who's checking the books to see what I did. But when I think about it in the sense of love evolving in itself, that makes sense to me. I must say it's right. I'm saying it makes sense to me. Love evolving itself within itself, that God is an evolving system that I can go to, that God is an evolving system. And if it is that infinitely good, it cannot see me or it, as in shit in the Gaza or anything else, as bad, only in giving us the free will to do with it what we want and offer us this marinade of love to sit in and choose to take in or not. That's my, it's not the truth. It's my. So my conclusion has been that the highest value of God, like in the hierarchy of virtues and values, the tippy top one is freedom. Freedom has to exist for love to exist. Yes. Love can only exist within freedom. I believe that God made the universe or God caused the Big Bang or however you might like to yeah. think about that. But I believe that the universe and us have been given the freedom to develop as we choose. And that is true at the the normal human level of you and I having a conversation, but it's also true at a cellular level. It's also true at a subcellular level. And all of it is evolving within a measure of freedom in the context of what's going on around it. And that God does not dictate what that is. And there's not some program that everything's running on like an algorithm or a recipe. And that's why love can exist. And in a universe where love can exist, you're also going to have hate and you're also going to have Gaza. Yes. So I also believe in heaven. Well, how could there be a heaven and there still be love? I think for heaven to exist, we have to willingly surrender our privilege or right to believe untrue things. I think if we make a choice to accept the truth, then it becomes possible for a world without hate to exist. But we have to choose that first. And God will not impose that on us. The, but the challenge becomes, in that word you just used, truth. Because now we're down to the same argument again. Well, your truth is not my truth. And you can't prove your truth any more than I can prove my truth. But here's a piece of my story. Yeah. Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And when I was going through my existential crisis and I was reading evolution, most of these books, by the way, are either science books or evolution books or something. Right. Incredible amount of stuff. I said, you know, I'm not sure whether Jesus is who Christians think Jesus is or not. I'm not sure about that. But that statement, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. I think that's true. And that was enough to get me through that. I'm not having an existential crisis anymore. I'm very comfortable in my own skin about all those questions. Yeah. That little piece, the truth will set you free. Okay, I realize I don't have the complete truth, but I can pursue the truth and I can be honest as best I know how. And I can exercise courage when I'm scared instead of, hiding under a basket somewhere and sticking my head in the sand. I was 
sorely tempted to stick my head in the sand. But you know what, Dove? I would have never discovered what I did discover if I hadn't been willing to consider maybe the atheists are completely right. And I look at the world from their point of view. Yes. For example, why is it a good idea to not say God did it every time you have a scientific mystery? When there's a scientific mystery and somebody says, well, God did it. That's your answer. That pisses off atheists. It also pisses off scientists. Why is that good? Because God did it is an ultimate, it's like a North Star kind of an answer. It's not an immediate answer you can hold in your hands. You say, well, why did that lightning strike? God did it is not a good answer. We need to understand electricity and lightning. And so we do. I had to come around and see what is every good thing about their point of view that I can think of. And could I argue their point of view persuasively and fool somebody into thinking I'm one of them? Could I argue their points even better than they do? And only because I did that was I suddenly able to see, hey, wait a minute. There is this infinite rabbit hole in the middle between the creationism and the atheism. There's this infinite rabbit hole of how deep actual real science goes. Yes. In my opinion, science and nature are, for all practical purposes, infinitely deep. I think subatomic particle and a sub-subatomic sub particle and a sub-sub-subatomic particle, I would hesitate to even guess how deep that goes. Yes. I would guess that we have only scratched the surface there are worlds within worlds within worlds that we haven't even thought of right under our nose. And that's the only way that you can do science, true justice. Yeah, I think that for me, where I think you and I meet very well is that my hunger for spiritual understanding is equal to my hunger for scientific understanding. And I don't see a separation. Yes. I see an evolution of my understanding, yep. but I can't see a separation. I know that many of my previous ideas about God have changed dramatically, and I know that many of my previous ideas about science have changed dramatically, and really understanding that you say that it's freedom, and I can see why you say that, and I don't disagree with that, because freedom gives, as you said, is causation for love which is lovely. I, I, I like that. And for me, maybe as a, a catalyst into that freedom is my religion, curiosity. If I don't have the ability to, to be curious, which I have the ability to also shut down. If I don't have the ability to be curious, then I don't have the ability to be free in my thinking. And if I don't have the free ability to be free in my thinking, then I'm only in reaction to, as opposed to being in a choice. And I will not deny that there is some new neuroscience that is coming out that's saying that maybe there is no free will, and I'm going to be exploring that, right? Um, but it's this, the tension of curiosity. Curiosity is this thing that pisses me off immensely because it can always give me far more questions than I can answer, but I know it's the fuel in my fire. Curiosity and faith are not very different from each other. No, because they pull, like it pulls you. And I think that blind curiosity is like blind faith. It's stupid. Yeah. But willing curiosity is like, I'm willing to go deeper into that. I'm willing to understand my faith at a deeper level. That's expansive for everybody. Mm -hmm. And so that is the thing that, for me, keeps the fire on. I know that we're out of time. It's been a joy, as always, my friend. Thank you. Always so good to talk to you about this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> You and I definitely have some great combos, and uh, there's so much more we can get into. And I want to thank you for your time, mate. I know you're a busy lad, and I appreciate it. The fact that you took time to be on, on the show is very exciting for me. Thank you so much. Thank you for all you're doing. Thanks for the research. Please tell people where they can find out about you, find out about Evolution 2.0, and all the papers and everything they can find out about. Go to evo2.org and sign up for the newsletter, evo2.org. We have a podcast. We'll send out very interesting emails about interesting topics like this. We'll get you in the loop. And if you found this fascinating, there's lots more. You vote too. There is indeed. And there's lots more, even in the fields of where we go into, into cancer research and a bunch of other things. 
that we've been doing and having conversations on. It's really cool. Stay tuned. Stay curious. It really is delicious. And for you, Perry, thank you so much for being with us. And for you, dear listener, remember that those who control the meaning for the tribe also control the movement of the tribe. Therefore, leaders committed to positively shaping the political and business landscape know that we've got to tap into what drives human behavior. And that means understanding how to apply the anatomy of meaning extracted from the emotional source code of individuals, of organizations, of nations, in order to build behavioral profiles, deception detectors, persuasion, influence, and expansion. I'm Darth Barron, and I'm here to show businesses, teams, and leaders how to harness their emotional source code to move their tribe, because unified, actualized meaning is a single monolithic difference between mediocrity and greatness for individuals and companies. Remember, we need your help in staying relevant. So please do whatever you can to rate, review, subscribe to the show. It makes a huge difference and share the link with everybody else. If you enjoyed this, let us know. Write a review. Write to me. Tell us. Write to Perry. Tell him. It really does matter. Till next time, stay curious, my friends. Stay curious about the cognitive intelligence that exists at every element, every essence of your being beyond your cognitive thinking. And that it is evolving your body, evolving your mind, and evolving you. I'm Dal Baron. I'm here to assist you tapping into your deepest meaning to reach that next level of clarity, focus, purpose, and profit in your business, in your life, and in your leadership impact. And I am out.